Councilor Siomo. Councilor Conley. Councilor Consalvo. Councilor Jackson. Councilor La Martina. Councilor Linhan. Councilor Murphy. Here. Councilor O'Malley. Here. Councilor Presley. Councilor Ross. Councilor Yancey. President, we do have a quorum. I'm informed by the clerk that a quorum is present. I'd ask all guests and all counselors to please rise at this time, as I have the honor to introduce Father Jack Ahern from St. Peter, Holy Family, and Blessed Mother of Teresa of Calcutta Parishes to deliver today's invocation. After Father Jack delivers today's invocation, I'd ask all of you to please remain standing as I lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Father Jack Ahern. Ever gracious God, two months ago yesterday, President Obama lifted our spirits as he said, and I quote, Scripture tells us to run with endurance the race that is set before us. Run with endurance the race that is set before us. On Monday morning, the sun rose over Boston. The sunlight glistened off the State House dome. In the common and the public garden, spring was in bloom. It was a beautiful day to be in Boston, a day that explains why a poet once wrote that this town is not just a capital, not just a place. Boston, he said, is the perfect state of grace. End of quote. That day, as we know, ended in darkness. But the sun has risen over this special place, the state of grace, our beloved city, every morning since that dreadful day. And we have stood together, one Boston, Boston strong. Mayor Menino reminded us as members, reminded us as members of this council, leaders and regular folk of our city alike stood by him, that nothing can defeat the heart of the city because we take care of one another. It is a glorious thing, the love and strength that covers our city. This is Boston, a city with the courage, compassion, and strength that knows no bounds. As scripture reminds us, the race is still before us, and the work of our city continues. The work includes more summer jobs and programming for our youth, continued strides in the betterment of our schools, the lessening of violence in our streets, sustained development in every neighborhood of our city, budgets, and much, much more. The summer is upon us. For some, the race before them is to the nearest beach. For many others, many here assembled, the race ahead of them is not to the beach, but for a position beyond this chamber. Loving God, in 201 days, Mayor Menino will pass on his baton of excellence and innovation, compassion and love for the city onto someone else, perhaps to someone in this august body. As much as I am tempted, Lord, I will offer no candidate's name for your special benediction. <laughs> But I do ask your blessing on all of them. May they and all of our city councils know your gifts of wisdom, counsel, and understanding. And may our beloved city and all live, work, and recreate here know your gifts of joy and peace, kindness, goodness, and respect that will keep us Boston strong, one Boston. We ask these things in the power of your holy name, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Father Jack, for your inspiring words. Please join us as we salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Clerk, would you please uh, amend the uh, attendance to uh, reflect the uh, presence of Councillor Arroyo and Councillor Consalvo and Councillor John Connolly? Sixty percent of the mayoral candidates are now uh, before us. With us, <laughs> thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, we have a presentation. I'd like to call upon City Councillor Matt O'Malley to the podium to deliver the first of two presentations this morning.
Councillor O'Malley. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to invite members of the Project Hope Marathon team to join me up on the dais. Uh, and I want to speak very, very briefly about two of the great passions of my life, one being Project Hope, the other being the Boston Marathon. Um, Project Hope is, is a wonderful multi-service agency that I'm so proud to be affiliated with and serve on the advisory committee with, uh, which is really a, a, a jewel in the city of Boston. Uh, it helps, the tagline is it helps uh, women and families move up and out of poverty, and literally tens of thousands of lives have been saved by this organization, which helps with uh, education, job training and job placement, housing, life skills, parenting skills. It's a wonderful place. It started under the small street on Magnolia Street uh, and under the direction of the absolutely amazing sister Margaret Leonard. It's now uh, on Dudley Street. It's thriving. It is literally a wonderful, wonderful place that has helped so many um, Boston families and those from greater Boston and has really helped strengthen our city. Uh, the second part is the Boston Marathon, which I know we all have our own uh, connection to, and particularly this year, it's never uh, burned more strongly. Um, there are a lot of charities that participate in the Boston Marathon. I've actually run for three different charities, including Project Hope, and they're all good things. And these are particularly good for me, someone who could never qualify uh, to run the race on my own. So to have the opportunity to run it uh, and to give back to a charity. And as I said, there are great charities, but this one in particular is really noteworthy because every dollar raised, and I know many of you have donated to me through these, this charity and through these endeavors over the last couple of years, every dollar raised goes directly to Project Hope. You know, so many charities have uh, the fundraising is built in for overhead, for running the program itself, which is important. But with Project Hope, a bunch of guys uh, and women that you will hear from uh, briefly will talk about how it was formed to really give back. And you can see that direct impact in the city of Boston. Um, this is the third year that the Project Hope Marathon team has been in existence this year. And over a three-year period, it's raised over $500,000 uh, for Project Hope. Again, all money's going there. So I want to take this opportunity to highlight the great work that's being done. And I will close just by urging all of you to uh, visit Project Hope if you haven't already. Uh, use it as a resource for so many uh, of our constituents that may need help. There are so many great programs and again, so many lives that can be saved. So I'd like to invite the uh, first, the heart and soul of the marathon team, the captain, uh, Mark Kamininski, uh, to talk a little bit about what has been done um, and to uh, give you more background on this great organization. So, Mark. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Kamenetsky, and I'm one of the uh, uh, co-founders and the captain of the Project Hope Marathon team. Um, just tell you a little bit about the genesis of it, and then I'm going to introduce Sister Margaret, who will talk more about Project Hope. Um, a number of us have run uh, many marathons uh, here in Boston over the years, and we've run for um, a lot of the large national charities. And one of the issues that we've had in doing that, although those teams are great and those charities are great, is we didn't really have any direct understanding or direct visibility to where the money we were raising was going. And so we wanted to do something local. We wanted to do something that has what I call a direct cause and effect relationship to see where our dollars are being spent. And uh, we talked to a number of different local charities, and uh, we met with Sister Margaret, uh, was very impressed on um, what Project Hope was doing in the community. And uh, with that, we launched the team. And... Um, you know, we uh, have participated uh, with, with a number of people here in Boston who have um, uh, allowed us to get numbers. Uh, the first year, I think the team was uh, 18 people. And the next year, the team was 25 people. And this year, uh, we had 32 people on our team. And over the three-year period, we've raised uh, just about $500,000, which is surprising for a group of people who said, let's try this and see how we can do it. Here was the uh, was the, uh, the largest fundraising effort. Um, what was the check? The check is right here for two hundred and five thousand dollars that we just uh, presented to Sister Margaret, and we've done this all with uh, Marinino's Marinino's support. So um, it's been uh, it's been a great opportunity, and uh, you know, as we all know, uh, this year uh, we ran in some issues at the finish line, and this team plans to be back to be uh, bigger and stronger, uh, and. Um, you know, hopefully raise more money than we have in the past. After all, the President of the United States said it would be bigger and better, and I was supposed to bet on it, so I am. So uh, the team will be back, and we hope to move forward. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Sister Margaret, who will uh, speak more about Project Hope. Thank you. Thanks, Matt and Mark. And um, I wanted to thank all of you for welcoming us um, here today. 
and also to thank Matt, who's our marathon runner and probably our biggest ambassador, for your friendship and support and for inviting us to come here. It was, we actually had a great delight because it was wonderful to be able to visit with the mayor, who has been a longtime supporter of Project Hope and from our Dorchester and Rockbury neighborhood over many years. Um, and then we had the privilege to come here. So I just simply want to say very briefly, because uh, Matt did a very good job kind of talking about what we do, but just simply, it's in the heart of the North Dorchester Roxbury community of Boston, and Project Hope has been a success story. Um, we have seen a multitude of our city's most vulnerable families journey beyond homelessness and poverty, discover their voice and potential, and become agents of change in their own communities. And, um, and that is a thrilling for us to see that in this great city. We know clearly that access to resources, access to opportunity, has made all the difference for families who wish to be on this journey. Affordable housing, quality childcare, education that begins where they are at and moves to higher education and, uh, and careers. And clearly the issue of and jobs that pay a living wage with benefits. I have to say the issue of ending poverty in our most vulnerable communities is no secret. And I'm sure it's no secret to you as well. It is access to resources and opportunities in a supportive community. So the success of these families and Project Hope's mission is in no small way made possible by a multitude of friends and supporters and believers. Particularly today, we are grateful for the commitment of our mayor, for the city council, at, because, and to be in this place where all kinds of decisions have been made that have had a significant impact for our families. So, and then I also want to recognize the marathon runners that come from every place in the city of Boston who have opted onto this mission, who have run with families for hope, and who have advocated statewide as well for solutions that bring opportunity to our families. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for honoring them today by your presence here. And we have indeed been blessed. And thanks to each one of you for how you have participated in that. Thank you. Can everyone please join us up here at the rostrum for a uh, brief picture? you get my good side. will stand approved. Seeing and hearing no objections or corrections, the minutes are so approved. Madam Clerk, communications from His Honor, the Mayor. 
Docket number 1030, Message and Order for Annual Appropriations and Tax Orders for FY 2014, filed in the Office of the City Clerk on June 17, 2013. Docket 1030, Chair recognizes Councillor Bill Linehan on Docket 1030. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I, I rise because uh, it is apparent that in this uh, message and order for annual appropriation, that the Boston Police Cadet Program is not in this particular um, uh, tax order and appropriation. I wanted to uh, bring that to the attention of my colleagues and that there is still time for us to work with the administration to see that uh, that, that is included in some form or fashion in this uh, FY14 budget. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, docket 1030 uh, will be referred to the committee on ways and means. Docket number 1031, message and order of an, for an annual appropriation for the school department for FY 2014, filed in the office of the city clerk on June 17, 2013. Docket 1031 will be referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. Docket 1032, message and order approving an appropriation of $40 million to the other post-employment benefits known as OPEB, Liability Trust Fund, established under Section 20, of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 32B, filed in the Office of the City Clerk on June 17, 2013. Docket 1032 will be referred to the Committee on Ways and Means, Reports of Public Officers and Others. Docket number 1033, communication was received from Councillor O'Malley, Chair of the Committee on Government Operations, on docket number 0530, passed by the Council on May 22, 2013, and approved by the mayor on May 31st, 2013, regarding a petition for the special law on certain licenses for the sale of alcoholic beverages in the city of Boston. Chair recognizes City Councilor Matt O'Malley on docket 1033. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, docket, uh, zero, uh, docket number 0530, which was uh, introduced by Councilors Conley and Presley, we had passed. The mayor had signed it. This is just reflects a technical change uh, for Saria Temple and uh, the Outward Bound Academy. We just didn't have the right verbiage uh, in the bill, so this just clarifies that. Thank you to Christine O'Donnell for her good work. Just an FYI. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councillor O'Malley. Docket 1033 will be placed on file. Madam Clerk, Docket 1034. Docket 1034. Notice was received from the mayor of the appointment of Dr. Hadden Coleman to the Boston School Committee for a term expiring January 6, 2014. Docket 1034 will be placed on file. Docket number 1035. Notice is received from the mayor of the confirmation of the appointment of Lord Stremain as member of the Audit Committee for a term expiring June 8, 2018. Docket 1035 will be referred to the Committee on Post Audit and Oversight. Docket number 1036. Notice is received from the mayor of the confirmation of the appointment of Patrick F. Murray, Jr. as a member of the Audit Committee for a term expiring May 31, 2018. Docket 1036 will be referred to the Committee on Post Audit and Oversight. Matters recently heard for possible action. Mr. President. Go, go to matter. So I will read all the Yep, you can read all of the documents, <clears throat> Madam Thank Clerk. You. Yes. Right. Right. <laughs> Thank you. We appreciate it. <laughs> so we will do the first. first. Docket number 0913. Communication was received from the city clerk transmitting a communication from the Boston Landsmark Commission for the City Council's action on the designation of the Charles River Speedway Administration Building Landmark District in Brighton and Isabella Gardner Stewart Museum in Boston as a landmark, in effect after July 5th, 2013, if not acted upon. So this is separate. So if you want to the question now comes on acceptance of the committee report and passage of Docket 0913. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Docket 0913 has passed. Docket number 0670, message and order authorizing the public schools to reestablish in accordance with general law, Chapter 44, Section 53E and one half, 
a revolving fund to accept from the fund up to a maximum of $1,800,000 to support the maintenance and repair of Boston Public School facilities, including custodial and utility costs for extended building time, floor refinishing, landscaping, and building repairs. Docket number 0671, message and order authorizing the public schools to reestablish in accordance with General Law Chapter 44, Section 53E and a half, a revolving fund to accept from the fund up to a maximum of $1,500,000 to repair and purchase Boston Public School computers, technology, including computer, mobile devices, and instructional software. Docket number 0672, message and order authorizing the police licensing division to reestablish in accordance with General Laws Chapter 44, Section 53E and a half, a revolving fund to accept from the fund up to a maximum of $350,000 for the new Hackney driver applicants. Docket number 0673, message and order authorizing the Mayor's Office of Artists, Tourism, and Special Events to reestablish in accordance with General Laws Chapter 44, Section 53E and a half, a revolving fund to accept from the fund up to a maximum of $300,000 to purchase goods, services to support cultural, artistic, and community events throughout the city of Boston. Docket number 0674, message and order authorizing the Boston Police Academy to reestablish in accordance with General Laws Chapter 44, Section 53E, one half, a revolving fund to accept from the fund up to a maximum of $200,000 for offices from non-City of Boston law enforcement agency police officer training purposes. Docket number 0675, message and order authorizing the Boston Fire Academy to reestablish in accordance with General Laws Chapter 44, Section 53E, one half, a revolving fund to accept from the fund up to a maximum of $200,000 to support training programs for firefighters from non-City of Boston fire agencies. Docket number 0676, Message and order authorizing the fire department to reestablish in accordance with General Laws Chapter 44, Section 53E and a half, a revolving fund to accept from the fund up to a maximum of $150,000 to support Massachusetts Oil and Hazardous Material Release Prevention and Response Act. Docket number 0677, message and order authorizing the public schools to reestablish in accordance with General Laws Chapter 44, Section 53E and one half, a revolving fund to accept from the fund up to a maximum of $125,000 transportation costs, including bus and public transportation costs. Docket number 0678, message and order authorizing the Police Department Special Operations Division to reestablish in accordance with General Laws Chapter 44, Section 53E and a half, a revolving fund to accept from the fund up to a maximum of $100,000 to support the K-9 units training program for offices and police dogs for non-City of Boston law enforcement agencies. Docket number 0679, message and order authorizing the fire department to reestablish in accordance with General Laws Chapter 44, Section 53E and a half, a revolving fund to accept from the fund up to a maximum of $20,000 to support Massachusetts Oil and Hazardous Material Release Prevention and Response Act. Speaking on dockets 0670 to 0679, Chair recognizes City Councilor Mark Siomo. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, can I take uh, ask for a recess, a quick recess? Councilor uh, Siomo asked for a brief recess. Centers for Youth and Families, BCYF, to reestablish uh, a revolving fund for 2014 in the amount of $300,000 to pay salaries and benefits of employees and to purchase supplies and equipment necessary to operate the Ellen Jackson Children's Daycare Program. Docket number 0864, 
message and order authorizing the Boston Center for Youth and Families, BCYF, to reestablish a revolving fund for 2014 in the amount of $750,000 to pay salaries and benefits of employees and to purchase supplies and equipment necessary to operate the City Hall Child Care Program. Docket number 0865, message and order authorizing the property management animal control unit to reestablish revolving fund 18096A for 2014 in the amount of $200,000 to re reimburse for administrative costs to those city agencies which enforce CBC Chapter 16, Section 1.9 and 1.9B, and for the costs associated with licensing and registration. Speaking on dockets 0670 through 0679, 863, 864, and 865, Chair recognizes Councillor Mark Field. And I thank you, Mr. President. Uh, last year, the city, with our approval, established some new revolving funds and reauthorized uh, existing uh, revolving funds. Uh, revolving funds are a practical budgeting tool that allows flexibility for departments that offer programs that charge fees. For example, uh, our police training program uh, trains other municipalities but charges a fee for that service. So those fees will now go into the revolving fund to pay the expenses of our BP Boston Police Department training of other municipal police departments, for example. Uh, revolving funds have grown to 13. We have established a more transparent and thorough reporting structure. Annual approval of these revolving funds is required by their enabling legislation. The committee held public hearing on all these dockets concurrent with the fiscal year 14 departmental budget hearings on April 29th, May 7th, May 14th, May 16th, June 11th, and a recap hearing on June 18th, all in 2013. So this will allow us to have a more standardized reporting structure, uh, annual reports on all the revolving funds. I distributed packets with all the uh, year-to-date uh, re revenues and expenses, uh, and that will be the structure that we will be proceeding with uh, from here on in. So I recommend that we pass. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Siomo. Uh moves acceptance of the committee reports and passage uh, of docket uh, 0670. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Docket 0670 has passed. Council Siomo moves acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 0671. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Docket 0671 has passed. Council Siomo moves acceptance of the committee report and passage of Docket 0672. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Docket 0672 has passed. Council Siomo moves acceptance of the committee report and passage of Docket 0673. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Docket 0673 has passed. Council Siomo moves acceptance of the committee report and passage of Docket 0674. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, aye. no. The ayes have it. Docket 0674 has passed. Council Siomo moves acceptance of the committee report and passage of Docket 0675. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Docket 0675 has passed. Council Siomo moves acceptance of the committee report and passage of Docket 0676. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Docket 0676 has passed. Council Siomo moves acceptance of the committee report and passage of Docket 0677. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Docket 0677 has passed. 
Council Sioma moves acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 0678. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Docket 0678 has passed. Council Sioma moves acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 0679. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Docket 0679 has passed. Council Sioma moves acceptance of the committee report and passage of dockets 0863, 864, and 865. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Dockets 0863, 864, and 865 have passed. Docket number 0994, message and order approving the, the compensating balance agreement by, by and between the city and Citizens Bank for the provision of lockbox services for the collection of real estate, personal property, motor vehicle, excise, and boat excise tax services. Docket number 0995, message and order approving the compensating balance agreement by and between the city and Citizens Bank for the provision of direct deposit account services. Docket number 0996, message and order authorizing, <clears throat> approving the compensating balance agreement by and between the city and Citizens Bank for the provision of credit slash debit card banking services. And lastly, docket number 0997, message and order approving the compensating balancing agreement between the city and Citizens Bank for the provisions of banking services. Um, please, Madam Clerk, amend the attendance to include Council Yancey at this time. Chair recognizes Council Mark Siomo on docket 0994 through 0997. Uh, thank you again, Mr. President. Uh, we held the hearing yesterday. Uh, testimony was provided by Meredith Wienick, the CFO, as well as Vivian Leo from Treasury. Uh, they provide an overview of the, the process. It's a, a request for proposal. Uh, many banks, I think as many as eight banks, applied to provide all these services. They're actually able to break up the, the several different uh, um, aspects of banking services. Uh, the treasurer awarded the contract to Citizens Bank uh, based on the ability uh, to uh, execute banking service for the city of Boston and also ensure safety and security of all of our funds. So I recommend that we uh, pass this. Chair recognizes City Councilor Felix Arroyo. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am, um, all due respect to the administration, to the, to the chair, be voting in opposition to this. And uh, it's because I attended the hearing ask questions many of my colleagues would expect me to ask. What level of investments were shown to have in the neighborhoods? Small business lending, home lending, refinancing of loans, development projects, hiring of Bostonians. We didn't have good answers for a number of reasons. One, when you go online, the link deposit reports up to date up to 2010. We're now in 2013. Uh, they did it based on 2010 numbers. Other municipalities like Los Angeles get annual reports directly from the bank that show the level of investments in the neighborhoods. Uh, there's no reason why we couldn't do that as well. Um, and so my opposition today rises because I think it's time. Our process should be different. Our process should weigh heavily the amount of investment that our financial institutions that we do business with uh, have in our neighborhoods, in our communities. What, do they make our neighborhoods stronger? Do they invest in our small business districts? Do they create, ha, have, do we now have more homeowners? Are we helping to save people's homes? Are we hiring Bostonians? Are we supporting development projects that will put people back to work? We don't have the answers to these questions. None of you will have the answers to these questions. Uh, and because I don't think there's enough information, I will be uh, voting no on this. Um, uh, and on another note, I'm looking forward this year to being the year that we pass Invest in Boston. This could be the last year where we don't have those answers. This could be the last year where we go through this process where you don't know, as an at-large counselor, or you don't know as a district counselor, what investments are happening in your neighborhoods as a result of leveraging over a billion dollars that the city has in, in banking services. You should know. You should be able to point to small businesses that have been opening, to new homeowners, to families that are staying, to development projects that are happening. You should know that. This should be the last year that this happens. As the author of the Invest in Boston, I'll be doing everything I can to move that bill and pass that bill, and I'll be asking all of my colleagues uh, to join me in that so that moving forward for many years to come, 
will have the same responsible banking ordinances that many municipalities like Los Angeles and New York City currently hold that show them the investments that go on in neighborhoods and that encourage investments in the neighborhoods that create economically sustainable neighborhoods, neighborhoods that are vibrant and thriving. It's very possible, and, and I know that we can do it together. Thank you, Council Arroyo. Council Siomo at this time moves acceptance of the committee reports and passage of dockets 994 through 997. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Dockets 0994 through 0997 have passed. Madam Clerk, would you please indicate that Councilor Arroyo has voted no on all four of those dockets? Thank you. Docket number 0904, message in order to accept and expend reimbursements up to the amount of $7,500,000 from various government agencies, including the Federal Emergency Management Agency, known as FEMA, for expenses related to the April 15, 2013 Boston Marathon ex explosions. Docket number 0905, message in order to accept and expend reimbursements up to the amount of $4,700,000 from various government agencies, including the Federal Emergency Management Agency, known as FEMA, are expenses related to the February 8, 2013 blizzard. Chair recognizes Council Mike Ross on docket 0904 and 0905. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I would ask that we pass docket 0905, but um, I would ask that we hold off on passing docket 0904. Uh, it's uh, funds that are coming back to our city um, to reimburse uh, our first responder departments that have already outlaid those uh, expenses. Um, there's no uh, danger in holding off uh, any, any amount of time right now. Uh, but just for the fact that a lot of information at that hearing needed to come in that didn't come in. And uh, I think that just out of respect for this body, we need to make sure that that information comes in. So. I would ask to hold off on 0904 and to move with 0905 today. 0904 remains in the Committee on Public Safety. Councillor Ross moves suspension of the rules and acceptance of the committee report on docket 0905. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Docket 0905 has passed. Docket number 0993, message in order approving a supplemental appropriation of $6 million for the Boston Public Schools to cover FY13 costs, providing services to meet the needs of a growing number of students with disabilities. These services include applied behavioral analysis, known as ABA services, for students with disabilities. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, Council be in brief recess. Docket number 1037. Councilor Presley offered the following order approving a petition for special law regarding the return authority of the liquor licenses process to the City of Boston. Chair recognizes City Councilor Ayanna Presley on docket 1037. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, throughout the last year, I've met with local entrepreneurs, main streets, neighborhood, and civic groups, as well as many of you. And in every conversation from Dorchester to South Boston to Roxbury to Mattapan, one thing is consistent. The current law is hurting business development and growth in our neighborhoods. 
That is why I'm filing today's home rule to eliminate the state cap on alcohol licenses. It's time that we take legislative action, that control be returned to the city. It's time for us to determine how to economically revitalize our neighborhoods. This sentiment and these frustrations extend far beyond our city. I have partnered with broad-based coalition of municipal leaders across Massachusetts, from Somerville's Mayor Joe Curtitone to Salem's Mayor Kim Driscoll. And in conversations with Secretary Bilecki, I also learned that the current process and the cap on licenses is causing development deals to fall through. We know the market is demanding smart growth, mixed youth, transit-oriented development, but deals are falling apart because the proposed restaurants can't get alcohol licenses. We are losing housing, we are losing jobs, and we are losing people. This home rule addresses some of the most pressing concerns expressed to me in the last year about the current law. One, this home rule eliminates the cap on liquor licenses. Two, it will eliminate the transfer of liquor licenses out of our empowerment zones, urban renewal districts, and transit-oriented developments. Three, it will close the loophole that ties a license to a location rather than a business. Four, this home rule grandfathers existing licenses so that current owners may retain the ability to sell it if they so choose. New licenses will be returned to the city. Just this morning, I met with the West Roxbury Business and Professional Association to talk with them about this home rule. And the reoccurring theme of concern was that by lifting the cap and creating competition, current licenses would be devalued. Well, for one, I think competition is a good thing. Stronger businesses bring more people and more revenue. Although I can appreciate the concerns of individual business owners, it's our job to ensure the economic vitality of all of our neighborhoods. Counselors, we have had many conversations about this in and outside of this chamber. I'm grateful for your respective leadership and your collective partnership on this. And I need all of you, we need everyone to keep working on this to see this home rule unanimously passed. Restaurants are places where people gather with family and friends to enjoy a meal and a drink. But the reality is restaurants cannot survive without an alcohol license, and we need them to survive. The role that retail previously played in the marketplace has completely shifted because retail has gone online. Restaurants are filling that gap. We need them to be successful. The current law is stifling competition, crippling small businesses and economic development, and denying neighborhoods the ability to build wealth and community. Thank you. Thank you, Council Presley. Chair recognizes Council Mike Ross to add his name. Chair recognizes Council Sal Lamatina. Thank you, Mr. President. I just saw him rise to um, commend uh, the maker and ask that my name be added. And I agree with right? all of us should go to the State House and fight uh, for this home rule petition. I think it's important for our neighborhoods. And um, I've seen it too in, in a lot of my neighborhoods where businesses do not survive because they don't have a beer and wine license or a liquor license. So I am honored to add my name to this. Thank you. Please have the name of Councilor La Martina. Uh, Chair recognizes Councilor Tito Jackson. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I rise to commend uh, the maker. Uh, recently, I co-sponsored um, an order on um, how to get liquor licenses in uh, Dudley Square um, so we could bring economic empowerment uh, to Dudley Square. We know that uh, restaurants are in a quandary in the city of Boston. Uh, se they have a 7 to 11 percent margin on food. You're not able to pay the bills. Uh, you're not able to keep the lights on with that type of margin. Um, and I am the component here that's very attractive is not allowing these, these licenses to leave empowerment zones because the area that I live in um, and actually work in uh, along the Blue Hill Ave corridor, we've lost two licenses. I think they're over in uh, Council Linehan's district now, but um, they went for 450, one went for 400,000, the other went for 450,000. And I, I want folks to realize that I, I know we want to protect the business owners who made this investment, <clears throat> but it's this very issue that has actually caused the licenses to actually be inflated in value. The intent was 
The licenses cost seven or eight thousand dollars, like a new license costs. But it's our procedures and the the handcuffing of this body and the city uh, to actually issue our own licenses. We are the closest to our people. We are held accountable on a daily basis to the people who elect us into this body. So I think we should have the opportunity and the municipal government should have the opportunity to actually control our own destiny. Uh, we folks have our, our cell phone numbers. They have our, our numbers to our offices. And so I think this is really great legislation. It's forward thinking and thinks about what we need to see in the city of Boston in areas that currently have maybe too many and also in areas that don't have enough. So I would love to have my name added. And I, again, uh, credit uh, the work that many folks in this body have done um, of, around this issue. Um, very happy to hear what's happening in West Roxbury and other places, but I'm also um, very proud of the work that Councilor Pressey has done on this. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilor Jackson. Please add the name of Councilor Jackson. Chair recognizes Councilor Rob Consalvo. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. President. I, I want to rise to ask that my name be added, and I want to thank the maker for her very thoughtful and methodical approach of spending a couple of years researching and talking to folks and, and drafting a piece of legislation that can, uh, you know, finally pass to, to address a lot of the issues. And I want to thank her for including the very controversial loophole piece that I've harped on uh, about tying the license to an address versus an individual. And that's a critical piece of this whole problem in terms of uh, helping foster economic development. Uh, because, as you know, Mr. President, our address on Fairmount Avenue, and there's many examples of this, which the business owner renewed the license on January 1st and then left the premises, uh, blocked for an entire year a new restaurant from opening in that exact location because the license followed him wherever he went but was tied to that address, and you can't have two licenses at the same address in a calendar year. And I'm proud to say that a new restaurant, the Fairmount Grill, located on Fairmount Avenue, is in its second week, and it's a beautiful, phenomenal, wonderful place. I think I've seen your car parked out there every night this week, Mr. President. <laughs> and uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's done a great job, but it took a year, it took a year and a half for that business owner. Let me rephrase that. It took a year and a half for that business owner to be able to take his investment and open that location that he's, he had his heart set on, all because of this loophole. So I want to thank the maker for very thoughtfully including that in there, and it's going to close a major gap uh, in the problem with the liquor licenses. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Consalvo. There was a rumor that you were in there the other night buying rounds, and that's why I rushed down there to see. I actually took my camera with me to get a picture of it, unsuccessfully, though. Chair recognizes Councilor Felix Arroyo. I rise to commend the author to, to ask that my name be added. Uh, look forward to passage and very hopeful that the state uh, will pass this as well and committed to lobbying and working with our, our colleagues at the state level to get this done. Uh, you know, the West Roxbury patch actually reported um, in a tweet that as of 2011, Mattapan had nine, nine liquor license out of 1,241 in the city. Nine. That, that, that is not uh, conducive to community development. That's not conducive to building community. Restaurants, entertainment spaces, places to gather matter. An entire neighborhood, a neighborhood that has, if not the highest percentage of homeownership, one of the highest percentage of homeownership in our city, has nine liquor licenses. Yet people own their homes and live there and call that their community. And so this, I think, is a good way of looking at that and seeing what neighborhoods are underserved. Uh, it, I just use that fact because it's a fact about Mattapan, I think, being underserved when it comes to uh, liquor licenses, but I'm certain there are others. Uh, and helping that those, they have the opportunity as well to bring those restaurants, those gathering places, their social clubs, their uh, places to have, you know, a jazz band or a salsa band or some night activity that can help build community and bring people together. So I'm happy to sign on to this. Uh, I think it's, uh, it could be very key f towards community development across the board in the city of Boston. And Councilor Pressey, thank you for having filed this. Madam Clerk, please add the names of Councilor Consalvo, Councilor Arroyo, Councilor Baker, Councilor Siomo. Chair recognizes Councilor John Conley. Mm -hmm. Just to add his name, Chair recognizes Councilor Felix, um, Charles Yancey. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I, too, join the chorus in commending the maker. Uh, we've spoken on this issue many, many times, including the paucity of liquor licenses in, uh, in Mattapan. It's a question of economic uh, justice and equity, but also uh, 
Mr. President, I want to focus on the mere notion that we have to go hat in hand to the State House to get permission to grant these licenses. We are a very mature city. We have a great sense of uh, responsibility. And I think that this home rule process, not only with regards to liquor license, but even with regards to the term of the police commissioner, is actually regulated by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And it deserves plenty of attention in the 21st century. This is very anachronistic. The whole home rule process, I think, is, uh, is outmoded and outdated for the necessities of the 21st century. So I uh, enthusiastically uh, support uh, this home rule petition. I commend the maker and like to have my name added. Please add the name of Councilor Charles Yancey. Please also add the name Councilor Matt O'Malley, Councilor Bill Linehan. Madam Clerk, please add my name. And that matter will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. Docket number 1038. Councilor Jackson and Presley offered the following order for a hearing to discuss the implementation of an innovative and technology curriculum in Madison Park Technical Vocational High School. Chair recognizes the maker, Councilor Tito Jackson, on docket 1038. Thank you so much, Mr. President. I rise. I rise. Um, also in, in hope. Um, yesterday, uh, Patrick and Mayor Menino came together for a collaboration uh, called Rocks Map, Roxbury, Massachusetts Advanced Polytech Pathway. Um, it is finally a pathway for young people from the city of Boston who attend Madison Park Vocational Technical High School to have a five-year pathway to a job. Uh, for too long, both institutions have languished. For too long, both institutions have not produced the type of results that actually help our children. In fact, um, both institutions have actually, um, in many regards, hurt um, young people. Uh, I rise, Mr. President, to we uh, explore how we can move Madison Park Vocational Technical High School into the 21st century, uh, imparting 21st century skills into our young people, and also um, knowing that some of those young people may not choose to go to college. They should be prepared to, but they may not choose to go to college. And we have the Ferdinand Building, a $115 million project that's directly in the middle of my district uh, where... Uh, there's a great deal of union labor uh, and good jobs that are paying good wages where people can take care of their families. But to date, Mr. President, uh, the uh, graduation rate of Madison Park Vocational Technical High School is in the mid-50s. Uh, again, we are currently failing our students, and we need to move with urgency. We need to move uh, to remove any of the issues that are in that building. Um, I also think um, that that facility needs to be refreshed. Um, currently, when you go into the cosmetology section, if you plug in two plugs in the same, uh, the same plug, Mr. President, uh, there is a short. Um, and I think that word is indicative of what uh, we're leaving our young people with uh, currently when it comes to Madison Park. Um, we, this, this is a partnership between Roxbury Community College and Madison Park Vocational Technical High School. Partnership actually comes with equal partners, and we as a city have to step to the table to do the right thing by the over 1,100 young people who are at Madison Park. Um, and again, we have to move with urgency because this year has been a tumultuous year. These young people have been resilient, but they can only be resilient for so long. Um, they've produced... And we had them in here. Uh, they've been able to, to produce some stellar results, not because of, but in spite of the situation that they've been in. And so we need to explore not only uh, the, the athletic aspects of it, but how we can move that school uh, to where Worcester Technical High School uh, is. And I'll just note, and I'll end on this, my dream is that the young people at Madison Park will graduate at the same rate as Worcester Technical High School, where's 96% graduation rate. That has a 96% graduation rate for black 
actually for low income students and a 94% graduation rate for black and Latino students. We talk about achievement gap, their achievement gap is 2%. 78% of the young people from that school go on to a two or four year uh, program. And in fact, uh, Mr. President, all of the others go into uh, labor or the trades. That is exactly what we deserve for Madison Park Vocational Technical High School. And if we're going to enter into a partnership, we have to put up or shut up. And so, uh, Mr. President, I would look for an expedited hearing. Um, and I also want to thank uh, Council, uh, Councilor Presley for co-sponsoring this, uh, Councilor Conley and Baker for being vocal in this, uh, Councilor Yancey and Councilor Arroyo for being vocal uh, in this issue. If we do not produce the outcomes that we need for Madison Park Vocational Technical High School, the future of the city is actually on the line. And when we look at our friends who are in the trades, and there are many people who have aligned um, in, in that regard, the average age in the Boston building trades is 55 years old. This is the pipeline to the future, not only in the trades, but in biotech and life sciences and all of those things. So it's our time, and if we allow this school to languish where it is, history will not look well upon us as individuals, Mr. President. So I ask uh, for an ex expedited hearing, and I look forward uh, to the future. As goes Madison Park, we'll go to City of Boston. And uh, if we don't step it up, uh, we're going to fall behind. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Jackson. Um, chair recognizes the co-sponsor, Councilor Ayanna Presley. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I want to thank uh, Councilor Jackson uh, for his leadership, uh, steadfastly so, and in working in close partnership uh, with the friends of, of Madison Park. Uh, some very long meetings um, about this, and so we want to commend them for their activism. And uh, Councilor Jackson, uh, for your hearing, um, their ongoing concerns and frustrations and putting forth this order. And I thank you for inviting me to co-sponsor it with you. Um, at the heart of the ROCKS map, and it is timely given yesterday's announcement, but at the heart of the ROCKS map plan exists a great vision. And this vision is one focused on helping our children, advancing our communities, and improving our collective future. These two learning institutions have the potential to offer so much, and seeing that they are in such close proximity, it seems natural that we would link them. But I do want to say this. There has been a profound breach of trust, and there have been many starts and stops to turn around Madison Park. And so what I am heartened by is that not only do we have a good vision here, we also have good intention. Hopefully that will generate some goodwill. But more than that, a sizable investment in infrastructure, in curriculum, in leadership, and in human capital. So we have the vision, but without a vigilance to see that vision realized, this will all be in vain. And so I look forward to an expedited hearing and all of us working in partnership collectively to ensure that this vision, which is a five-year vision, is successfully implemented and that the potential of our students and their families and this neighborhood and our city is fully realized. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Presley. Chair recognizes Councilor Mike Ross. Yeah, my name, Mr. President. Please add the name of City Councilor Mike Ross. Please also add the name of Councilor Matt O'Malley, Councilor Bill Linehan, Councilor Sal Lamatina, Councilor Rob Consavo, Councilor John Connolly, Councilor Maxiomo, Councilor Frank Baker, Councilor Felix Arroyo. Madam Clerk, please add my name. Chair recognizes Councilor Charles Yancey. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I'd like to commend the sponsor and co-sponsor of this uh, hearing order. It's very appropriate, uh, Mr. President, because there are many students and families of students at Madison who unfortunately have given up. They work very hard. They want their children to succeed. The students receive messages from us every day in terms of what we do and what we fail to do. All of you have heard me talk about the need for a new high school and the fact that uh, we have 4,000 uh, Boston Public High School students attending classes in substandard buildings. Well, Madison is one of our newer buildings, and you heard about the condition of that facility. It was constructed in the 1970s. 
But what's more egregious than the fact that uh, our infrastructure in education very often uh, is made up of crumbling facilities, more egregious than that, Mr. President, is that we have students who are attending Madison who do not have the luxury or privilege of even having books they can take home. Now, that's not acceptable in the 21st century. So it's my hope, and I haven't had a chance to re re uh, review the resubmission of the budget, but one thing I'm going to take a close look at this, this afternoon is whether or not the administration is providing for additional funding so all students at Madison and other high schools and other schools have books that they can literally take home. I know we're in the digital age, but I don't consider sending children home with uh, Xerox copies of chapters is an example of where we are today in the 21st century. So I'm looking forward to this hearing. I'd like to have my name added and probably support my colleagues who offered it. But also, I want all of us to make a commitment to tell all of our students, particularly our high school students, that we really do care. And we are willing to make the sacrifices and the investment. And while I am not calling for a vote for the new high school today, I will in the very near future uh, and ask that all of our colleagues join in so that we can begin uh, to rectify the technology gap and facilities gap that uh, many of our high school students have to contend with and they succeed in spite of, but not because of, uh, those uh, shortfalls. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Yan Yancey. You should have your name added. These are the name of Councilor Charles Yancey. Docket 1038 will be referred to the Joint Committees of Education and Global Technologies. Um, Madam Clerk, if we could have a brief recess at this time. We had a, a second presentation earlier this morning, but the, the recipient was not available at the time we were doing our presentations. So uh, would you like to join me up here? Good afternoon. Um, today is uh, not just a busy day for the City Council. It's, it's also um, a day, it's a day um, for gratitude and for thanks. Uh, we all know the price we pay for public service. We know that it's not always the easiest road, but we also know that our presence in this building and other city buildings truly makes a difference in the lives of others. Um, today, we would like to recognize someone who has made a difference in this body, as well as the city as a whole, and that is Priscilla Tolan. I was going to call her Peachy, because that's what we all call her, Peachy Tolan. Um, Priscilla has worked for the city for 28 years. 26 of those years, she has served in the in in the city clerk's office. Uh, she is the woman, along with Chris Finnegan, behind the scenes that sort of keeps uh, the agendas on track and works closely with central staff and, and the budget director to make sure that um, what is before you is what's supposed to be before you. So today, uh, Friday will be her last day, and uh, it is very bittersweet because she is not just a valuable employee. Uh, she has been a friend to all of us. She's saved us several times <laughs> when we were falling off the cliff. And uh, I think it's only appropriate that we recognize her today. So, Mr. President, do you want to read? Anyway, uh, in, in recognition of Priscilla's uh, final day, Friday, uh, the Boston City Council has uh, declared Friday, June 21st, to be Priscilla Tolan Day in the city of Boston. We're asking all of you to come forward and get a picture with Priscilla as uh, we congratulate.
There's absolutely no chance I'll look as young as you. No. I've seen my dad, I know what he looks like. <laughs> That happened in an hour. <laughs> 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 Thank you, uh, Priscilla, for your years of competent, dedicated service. Uh, Madam Clerk, personnel orders. Docket number 1039, Councilor Murphy for Councilor Jackson offered the following. Councilor Jackson moves suspension of the rules and passage of docket 1039. All those in favor say aye, opposed no. The ayes have it. Docket 1039 has passed. Docket 1040, Councilor Murphy for Councilor Jackson. Councilor Jackson moves suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 1040. All those in favor say aye. Opposed no. The ayes have it. Docket 1040 has passed. Docket number 1041, Councilor Murphy for Councilor Baker. Councilor Baker moves suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 1041. All those in favor say aye. Opposed no. The ayes have it. Docket 1041 has passed. Docket number 1042, Councilor Murphy for Councilor Baker. Councilor Baker moves suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 1042. All those in favor say aye. Opposed no. The ayes have it. Docket 1042 has passed. Docket number 1043, Councilor Murphy for Councilor Linehan. Councilor Linehan moves suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 1043. All those in favor say aye. Opposed no. The ayes have it. Docket 1043 has passed. Docket number 1044, Councilor Min Murphy for Council Linehan. Council Linehan <laughs> moves <laughs> suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 1044. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Docket 1044 has passed. Docket number 1045, Councilor Murphy for Council Lamatino. Council Lamatino moves suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 1045. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Docket 1045 has passed. Doc Docket number 1046, Council Murphy for Council Lamatina. Council Lamatina moves suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 1046. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Docket 1046 has passed. I'm informed by the clerk that there are four late filed matters in her hands which in absence of objection will be added to today's agenda. Hearing no objection, the matters are so added, the clerk will read the first addition to the agenda. From the Boston Retirement Board to Joseph E. Cornerton, Executive Director of the Public Employees and Retirement Administration Commission, uh, 5 Middlesex Avenue, 3rd Floor, Somerville, Mass, 02145, Regarding granting of FY 2014 COLA, dear Mr. Connerton, please be advised that at a meeting on June 12, 2013, the Boston Retirement Board voted unanimously to grant a COLA of 3% on the first $13,000 of pension benefits for the fiscal year 2014, pursuant to General Laws Chapter 32, Section 103I. The City Council and the City of Boston were notified 30 days in advance of the board's intent to review, review the COLA for fiscal year 2014. If any further information is required, please feel free to contact me. Thank you. Daniel J. Green, Executive Officer of the Boston Retirement Board. Uh, read the second edition. Three, are they personnel in nature? Yes, they are. Three personnel orders. Councilor Murphy for Councilor Jackson offer the following Council Councilor Jackson moves suspension of the rules and passage of the second late file matter. All those in favor say aye. Opposed no. The ayes have it. 
Um, that second late file matter has passed. Councilor Stephen J. Murphy for Councilor Jackson. Councilor Jackson order. moves suspension of the rules. Passage of the third late file matter, which is personnel in nature. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The third late file matter has passed. Madam Clerk. Councilor Stephen J. Murphy for Councilor Jackson. Councilor Jackson, the Jackson moves order. suspension of the rules and passage of the fourth late file matter. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The fourth late file matter has passed. Uh, Chair recognizes City Council John Connolly. For what purpose does the... Uh, uh, to pull a uh, matter from the green sheets. Uh, okay, we're just kind of getting to that. Um, anybody wishing to remove a matter from the green sheets may do say so at this time. Chair recognizes Councilor John Connolly. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, rise to pull uh, docket number 0993 from the green sheets. And Clerk, will you please read docket 0993? In the Committee on Education, docket number 0993, sponsored by the Mayor, um, reads, Message and order approving a supplemental appropriation of $6 million for the Boston Public Schools to cover FY13 cost of providing services to meet the needs of a growing number of students with disabilities. These services include behavioral analysis, ABA services, for students with disabilities filed in the office of the city clerk June 10th, 2013. Speaking on docket 0993, the chair recognizes Councilor John Connolly. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. This was a uh, message and order sent uh, from the mayor on behalf of the Boston Public Schools. Uh, we held a hearing yesterday. We had uh, CFO John McDonough, who will become interim superintendent uh, shortly, President uh, Eileen Nash and John Veer, the two uh, heads of uh, the office uh, that oversees uh, students with disabilities. Uh, and uh, also had Meredith Wienick um, from the city uh, here. It's a $6 million supplemental appropriation. Uh, $5 million of the $6 million is going to fund applied behavioral analysis. That's programming for children with autism. Uh, and the reason uh, driving the uh, additional appropriation here is, is actually good news, uh, and that is uh, the district has uh, cut the gap uh, in... Uh, assessing uh, children, uh, typically three years old moving to four year old, uh, and uh, assessing them uh, and whether or not they're on the autism spectrum. So we've gotten better at identifying children on the autism spectrum. Uh, this has led to an increase in our numbers of children who are identified. It's a good thing because we're catching it early and we're able to deliver the programming uh, and allow these children. Uh, to thrive. Uh, this reflects a national trend. This is not particular to Boston. We're getting better at diagnosing kids on the spectrum, uh, but it requires more services. Uh, and uh, we have roughly 1,000 students on the spectrum right now, uh, of which about 550 are going to require this ABA services. So 5 million of the 6 million will go to that. Uh, sadly, we've also had an increase in the number of homeless children attending the Boston Public Schools. And as many of us know in this chamber, first-time families uh, experiencing homelessness has been on the rise. Number of children uh, who are homeless is on the rise. And uh, we also need some supplemental funding to help transport homeless children to their Boston Public Schools. Because what happens is, and what fortunately the state law provides for is, uh, these children will get bounced around from temporary housing to temporary housing, but the law allows them to stay at the school that's home for them. Uh, as it should be. But that requires transportation, uh, and we need uh, and, and, uh, supplemental funding uh, for that. Uh, overall, uh, this is a $7.6 million increase, but Boston Public Schools has found $1.6 million internally uh, through reallocations and savings and certain positions that haven't been funded. So they require $6 million uh, in external funding. And I'll just to make sure we get the record straight here, $4.3 million for external ABA services, 658,000 for internal ABA services, 989,000 for counseling for students with disabilities and students requiring support services, uh, this particularly our children in emotionally impaired strands, 984,000 transportation for homeless children, 595,000 uh, to the Alliance for Inclusion on a partnership with a specific BPS school, and $72,000 for occupational therapy and physical therapy for our children with special needs, or as BPS says, students with disabilities. I'm not particularly fond of that phrasing, but that's what they say. Uh, and so I think this is an allocation 
uh, that is definitely necessary, will make a positive impact for our children and some of our most vulnerable children, so I would urge passage. Thank you, Mr. President. I also want to thank the clerk for accommodating uh, this last-minute nature of this. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Conley. Councilor Conley, at this, at this time, moves passage of Docket 0993. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Docket 0993 has passed. There are five late file matters. Oh, Chair recognizes Councilor John Connolly. <laughs> Could I ask you unanimous consent to make a 30-second statement? Okay. No. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I forgot to mention for the record, the $6 million, I should have said this, the $6 million is not being released from reserves, where it's come from when we've covered BPS gaps in the past. It is coming from the jet fuel excise tax. We have actually collected more this year than anticipated. Uh, and so the $6 million will come from jet fuel excise. I should have put that on the record. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilor Conley. Uh, we are going to take a roll call vote on 0993 because it is a, an appropriation of some $6 million. So the clerk will call the roll on docket 0993. Councilor Arroyo. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Yes. Councillor Baker, yes. Councillor Siomo, Councillor Siomo, yes. Councillor Conley, yes. Councillor Conley, yes. Councillor Consalvo, yes. Councillor Consalvo, yes. Councillor Jackson, yes. Councillor Jackson, yes. Councillor La Martina, Councillor La Martina, yes. Councillor Linehan, yes. Councillor Linehan, yes. Councillor Murphy, yes. Councillor Murphy, yes. Councillor O'Malley, yes. Councillor O'Malley, yes. Councillor Presley, Councillor Presley, yes. Councillor Ross. Councilor Ross, yes, and Councilor Yancey. Councilor Yancey, yes. We have a unanimous vote. Unanimous Thank vote you. on docket 0993. Congratulations, Councilor Connolly. Um, the, there are five late file matters, which in absence of objection will be added to today's consent agenda. Hearing no objection, the matters are so added. The chair moves adoption of the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. Opposed say no. The ayes have it. The consent agenda is adopted. I ask all counselors and all guests to please rise at this time as we prepare to adjourn this week's meeting. Um, we will close in memory for the following individuals for the chair, Anne F. LaCourt and Dahlia Francis McDermott Kelleher. Thank you. The chair moves that when the council adjourns, it will do so in memory of the aforementioned individuals and is scheduled to meet again on Wednesday, June 26th at 12 o'clock noon. All those in favor of adjournment signify by saying aye. aye. Council stands adjourned. <laughs>